in the 1960s and 70s, uh, Soviet mathematics uh, achieved great successes. There were several very important breakthroughs made and uh, uh, several Soviet uh, mathematicians received uh, Fields medals. Uh, probably the most acclaimed mathematical primes awarded to young mathematicians for outstanding results, uh, widely considered a, a rough equivalent of a Nobel Prize in mathematics. And uh, this period uh, is often viewed as a, as a golden age of Soviet mathematics. And the interesting question is why was the golden age uh, in that period and how was it possible? Historians often uh, uh, suggest that uh, many talented uh, young people went into mathematics in the Soviet Union because mathematics was relatively free from ideological interference, unlike uh, biology with the Lysenko affair or uh, philosophy, fields that were heavily um, influenced by uh, government uh, policies and uh, party ideology. It's a possible explanation and in the um, it explains why there were so many talented people in mathematics. Another explanation is that um, so-called blackboard rule, that Soviets excelled in those disciplines which uh, did not require uh, heavy dependence on uh, equipment, on government subsidies, uh, where just a pen, a pen and paper or a blackboard and chalk would do, uh, that their uh, they could rely on, their, on themselves essentially to produce uh, scientific results. This is also a plausible explanation uh, that uh, you don't need any special condition to succeed. But just having talented people and uh, uh, having uh, sufficient conditions to succeed does not necessarily uh, produce a, a viable and vibrant uh, academic community. What you really need for an academic community to function is uh, social infrastructure that supports research. You need a social space where uh, researchers could meet and discuss their ideas. You need educational institutions uh, that would help raise a new generation of researchers. You need uh, freedom of putting forward new ideas. Uh, you need flexibility of curriculum. You need things that uh, are more intangible, uh, that uh, require certain efforts of the community as a whole to build them. And uh, if we uh, ask ourselves the question of how was the golden age in Soviet mathematics possible, we should look at these specific things that are necessary for the functioning of the mathematical community. And when we look at these uh, things, at the social infrastructure, we discover that surprisingly, um, there were many restrictions uh, in all these aspects of the social infrastructure. Soviet uh, mathematicians were restricted in terms of their contacts with uh, foreign mathematicians. They, uh, very few of them could travel abroad. Uh, publishing in uh, foreign journals was discouraged. It seemed like an unpatriotic. The uh, uh, admissions policies in uh, uh, major universities were often discriminatory uh, starting in uh, the early 70s when Jews, for example, uh, were barred from entering uh, the uh, Faculty of Mathematics and Mechanics at Moscow University. Uh, discriminatory policies were used also at uh, various academic institutions uh, in hiring researchers at the Institute of Mathematics of the Academy of Sciences. There were even uh, some physical restrictions on entering the spaces of these research institutions and educational institutions. Uh, they were surrounded by fences, they had guards, and they would admit only those who worked at those institutions. So people from outside couldn't come and uh, exchange ideas with, with these researchers. So they were, uh, the, the uh, publication outlets were controlled by people who would try to bar those undesirables, Jews or people who, who did some political transgressions, who try to bar them from publishing. So there were all sorts of limitations and restrictions on the functioning of the mathematical community, which made the emergence of a golden age seem quite unlikely. Even though you have these talented people, even though they don't need any, anything more than, than a paper and a pencil, 
but they, they didn't have the infrastructure that su would support the function of the functioning of the community. And uh, uh, still, the, the Golden Age did occur. And it occurred because that uh, infrastructure was created. W was created a, a parallel, in, in some sense, alternative infrastructure that, in some sense, complemented the existing official institutions in other senses, uh, existed independently from them. And that new uh, parallel social infrastructure including included some informal social institutions. First of all, uh, mass circles for high school students, uh, which were totally voluntary, not non-regulated um, types of mathematical instruction given at Moscow University to high school students by students of Moscow University voluntarily. Um, this social organization emerged from below, was not regulated by any uh, Soviet institution. Uh, mathematical, specialized mathematical schools uh, emerged in the early 1960s. Although they were formally part of the educational network, uh, they were uh, introduced uh, from below uh, by uh, enterprising scientists who uh, got permission from local educational officials to designate certain schools as specializing in mathematics and then they staffed those schools with uh, gifted teachers and promoted advanced curriculum which went totally uh, separately from the mainstream Soviet uh, high school education. Another form, informal uh, type of social institution uh, was a, a system of uh, um, laboratories that was set up at various uh, non-mathematical institutions or applied mathematical institutions, where uh, a, a powerful influential mathematician would uh, set up a laboratory, a biological laboratory or applied math laboratory, a computational laboratory, and would hire pure mathematicians to do pure mathematics research. Uh, so under the cover of applied research, they were actually able to do pure mathematics, would be able to hire talented mathematicians who could not get employment in any uh, regular academic institutions of pure mathematics. Many talented students, uh, particularly Jewish, uh, were barred from entering Moscow University and studying mathematics there. Uh, the whole generation, starting in the early 1970s, uh, didn't have access to uh, quality math education. And uh, math professors at Moscow University and other um, universities set up informal uh, evening courses in which they gave essentially the same courses they would give regularly at Moscow University. They gave the same courses to these kids who were not able to enter Moscow University and had to study engineering at some second-tier engineering schools. So through, through this uh, uh, system of informal courses, uh, quality education was given to a whole generation of uh, budding researchers. Uh, sometimes they would give even more advanced courses than at Moscow University. Sometimes students from Moscow University would come to these informal courses to hear instruction in, in more advanced subjects. As a result, uh, a, a community of uh, students interested in mathematics emerged outside the realm of official institutions, meeting at these informal courses, uh, after hours meeting at uh, mathematicians' homes, at their summer dachas, meeting uh, during nature walks, in all sorts of settings lying outside the regular um, setting of an academic uh, uh, research institution or a university. Finally, a very important uh, social space where uh, these formal and uh, uh, informal researchers interacted was a system of open seminars at Moscow University. The system of courses uh, for undergraduates at Moscow University was complemented by dozens uh, if not hundreds of different open seminars offered by uh, university professors to, uh, student, to the student body and also to those who were able to get in and walk into the Moscow University and get to the seminar room. 
Um, these uh, seminars offered uh, latest instruction and latest developments in mathematics that couldn't find its way into the rigid mathematics curriculum, but was accessible through the system of seminars. Probably the most famous of those seminars was a, uh, the seminar run by uh, uh, Israel Gelfand, who was not even a professor at Moscow University. Uh, he had a, uh, a temporary appointment there, but uh, he was able to uh, just reserve a room at Moscow University and offer his seminar. And his seminar became a staple of uh, the Moscow mathematics community because it uh, was a, uh, a seminar that essentially covered the whole of mathematics. The, interest, the research interests of Israel Gelfand were so wide that he welcomed, welcomed reports on all sorts of newest developments in mathematics in many different fields. So uh, whenever a new development, new interesting development occurred, he would invite a speaker to his seminar to give a report. So someone who would come to Gelfand's seminar always kept abreast of newest developments in mathematics. As a result, his seminar was the place to go in Moscow if you wanted to be aware of the latest developments. It became a hub of the mathematics community, a center of mathematical life. All these restrictions imposed by official institutions essentially forced a large number of talented mathematicians into this parallel infrastructure. And in the parallel infrastructure emerged a, an alternative community, a community uh, tightly knit together uh, with shared interests, shared passion for mathematics, is a, a particular ethos emerged, an ethos of an idealistic vision of mathematics or as a vocation, as something you would dedicate your life to, not necessarily expecting uh, material rewards, because these people couldn't expect material rewards. They were not even employed by official institutions. They were not, they, they, they were not paid to do mathematics. They, uh, they couldn't expect to get rewards for their uh, mathematical studies. So by, by being forced into that position, they accepted that particular ethos and a, a, an identity of a, a disinterested mathematician, mathematician disinterested in, in material rewards, someone who looked idealistically in, at his occupations emerged. That shared identity distinguished that particular group of mathematicians from, from the rest. And perhaps that was something that uh, not only gave those mathematicians an opportunity to do mathematics, but also a, an inspiration to do really good mathematics and to produce the golden age.